Hey friends, Catherine here. Uh, today I'd like to talk about online sampling. Many of us who do survey research have to acquire our sample source, uh, the people are going to participate in our survey research. And um, while some organizations and teams have the benefit of in-house panels or private communities or other ways of accessing really authentic, high quality participants, there are cases where we do have to survey broader populations, um, different populations, and some of us simply may not have access to in-house panels or communities. And so very often we turn to online panel providers. And so what I'd like to talk about today is some of the challenges with online panels and um, some of the things that might be on the horizon for improving the quality of online panels. I wanna share that this is a excerpt uh, from a longer interview that I did recently with uh, Andrew Moffat. Uh, Andrew is a true expert on online panels. He's been in the online sample industry profession um, as an insider in that profession for, uh, for uh, over 20 years. Um, and uh, I've got a little bio from him up here on the screen that I'm sharing. Um, so he's currently a partner and chief strategy officer at Opinion Route. Uh, prior to Opinion Route, he had been at Survey Sampling, which of course uh, is now Dynata. Um, and he has held a number of different leadership positions in the sampling industry. Um, one of the things that I really like about Andrew is he's really passionate about data quality. So um, he is interested in taking creative and thoughtful and rigorous approaches to making sure that people who are answering our online surveys are really authentic. Um, for those of you who may be Research Rockstar students, the full 30 minute a guest lecture that I did with Andrew is online in the training portal. So just check it out there, go to your dashboard and then to the Research Rockstar community and you'll find the full interview there. Um, and for now, what I'm gonna do is share a, an excerpt. Uh, it's about 12 minutes uh, from my conversation with Andrew. Hey, Andrew, thanks for joining me today. I know you and I've been talking about this topic for a while now, um, sort of curing the ills of online sampling, which is obviously a topic that's near and dear to our hearts. Um, I've personally been doing survey research for over 30 years myself, so I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, uh, you know, I saw the birth of online sampling, right? <laughs> yep. I was there myself for it. Yeah, things have changed from uh, the days when we were exclusively relying on paper surveys or telephone data collection. Um, so I was really happy to have you uh, be able to join us because I know you're, you've got a great deal of expertise in this area. And so I was wondering if you could, first of all, sort of introduce the topic a little bit to our audience about, you know, when we talk about quality and online sample, um, you know, how, how did we, you know, can you just like, briefly give us an introduction, like how did we get to this current place where there is some fair amount of widespread concern um, or questioning about the quality of online sample? Hmm. Yeah, really, uh, and, and the questions have changed over the years. Like when online <clears throat> first started out, it was really questions about representation and representativeness and if it's fit for purpose for the study that you're trying to do and, and today's conversation it feels as very much as just around sample quality and getting reliable insights from the data that you're collecting. And, um, and for me, uh, I think it, part of it goes to how online started. So online started very much with double opt-in panels at the forefront of how all research was done online, right? And, um, I spent many years at SSI, which was one of the leaders in online research, and I spent some time in different parts of the world seeing online start in not just the States, but across Europe and parts of Asia, and how you deal with kind of like population challenges and different things. And over the years, to get access to new markets and new countries or new audiences, um, because not everyone wanted to join online panels, um, people created technology to expand those sources beyond panels into mobile channels, into social gaming, into real-time kind of traffic from any websites and, um, and create kind of a broader access to people online, um, kind of similar to what happened with kind of an advertising and what you see there. 
And as that happened, um, over time, there's been a lot of investment into the kind of data collection side of the industry, a lot of investment into automating that supply as much as possible and creating optimization within that supply process. And uh, I would say that what's happening is at a broader scale, you have a smaller and smaller percentage of the overall available universe of survey participants being double opt-in panels and that's declining year over year and that's causing more and more of the issues that we see in the marketplace happening. Um, so when somebody does an online survey and they might be discarding a certain percentage of records because they feel like the records aren't uh, quality respondents, you're saying that part of that, the root cause behind that is because of how those participants are now being recruited. Correct. Correct. It's it's it, it's probably to me the, the the main thing as to why all of this is happening because <clears throat> ultimately what you've gone from is a double opt-in environment where you have some level of validation or control where you're validating email address and going to someone's inbox where you often have address verification, especially in the states of every individual that goes into those panels to kind of anyone within the internet available that wants to take a survey, whether it's to earn points on Farmville or to earn a game, in-game currency on a mobile app or something like that. And they're coming into the environment in a very different mindset than the people that are joining panels to begin with, right? Right. Um, and those same channels also have a lot more fraud within them that over time has gone more and more unchecked because as the world of fraud has evolved, the world of catching fraud within online research hasn't evolved that much. And so. Oh, well, let me ask you a question. Oh, let me just, I, I just want to interrupt you because I just want to clarify something. So, you know, I, I do understand that there are some interesting ways that panel companies, sample providers have started to recruit more participants, um, especially right. from hard to find demographic groups like young men, right, who yeah. are always a very challenging group to get. And any methodology. Um, yeah, and any methodology for anything, right? And right. so, um, so, you know, I appreciate this, that, that they, you know, that some of the companies are, uh, are, are doing different things, try to recruit some of those populations, like you mentioned, like gaming, right? So like tying it into, you know, a, you know, a, a, a mobile app, tying, some, tying it to something else where they're bringing people in. But when they do recruit people through those alternate means, isn't there a step at which those people are saying, yes, I, I want to join the panel and here's my basic demographics? Um, for the people that are just being recruited on the fly, likely not. Like you, you'll get asked maybe date of birth and some other things so that you can, you know, kind of triangulate that person if they come back again, so you can read their cookie or read their profile again and try to create a panel-like environment for your real-time respondents. But ultimately, there is no real-time verification that happens in any way. You're not doing email address verification or verification of anything along their path to taking your survey. Okay, so then when I'm using an online panel provider these days, some of the recruit is literally happening in real time. It's not just that they recruited their ongoing recruiting of, to their panel is just ongoing reaching through these different channels. It's literally a project gets initiated and that might drive recruiting um, to certain social sites that might be associated with a desirable screening criteria. Correct. Um, and it's not necessarily all panels all the time, right? Just to be clear, like there are some panels that do operate solely in a double opt-in type environment. They are much fewer than they used to be. Um, and then most panel companies, um, I call them more so supply companies because they're, they have some of their own supply that they own and manage and incentivize and recruit themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then usually around that asset you're you're building in programmatic supply through api or some other kind of just more autumn channels so that you can pull in more young males or more audiences to fulfill the demand that you have within your you know your company That's right and there's always been 
And there's also always churn, right? Like I remember even years ago when I ran a panel, a specialty panel for the IT, uh, for the IT industry, you know, yeah, we would lose like 30% a year. So there yeah. was constant work to try to fill in those really hard to find people. Right, and, and for panels, that changes for each panel too. It depends on the type of model they have with that panel list and what in like some, some of the larger panel companies have multiple panel brands, right? Where mm -hmm. they'll engage with people um, through different channels. So whether it's through loyalty channels and you wanna offer you know, mileage plus customers an opportunity to take surveys to earn mileage plus currency, you have that. But you have some that are um, basically designed just to, I call them churn and burn, basically. It's like, they can often turn themselves over twice a year, three times a year. And so they're like this constant stream of new people kind of coming into these panel environments and, and they're quite common. And, and within panel companies, you know, I think everyone operates differently. There is no, there is no like every panel company is the same. Um, the percentage of double opt-in panel that you get within a, a given panel differs like some, some of their, Asset, as I said, might be 100% double opt-in. Some might be 5% opt-in. Um, and uh, that's, I guess, something you can figure out for yourself when, you, when yeah. you're talking to them. No, but I think it's a really interesting point because, um, and, and this is probably just because I haven't been, you know, since I'm, you know, spend a lot of my time teaching these days, um, I yeah. haven't had to order online panel myself in the last few years. And so I didn't realize that if I were to, that now, it is something for me to consider like you know my are the people that are the suppliers that i'm considering um do they have a double opt-in panel and if not you know what else do i need to know to feel good about the quality that i'm likely to get from the part of their panel that's not double opt-in right and then you have others like exchanges which are pretty prominent now too these are kind of champions of programmatic samples so as many real time companies like like a Lucid or a Scent or a Pure Spectrum and, and people like that who are basically amalgamating supply in an open and transparent way. Um, yeah. Like you see a lot of, you know, similar kind of trends within those areas. And, and some of those have kind of more name your price type functions within there. Um, so you can buy cheap, but once you buy cheap, you also open yourself up to more poor quality or, or fraud type stuff that can make it your way into your survey. So right. um, it's quite a complex world, the supply part of it, right? And the way we have looked at it over the years is that it's, you know, outside of people, it is your your number one line item. Um, and if maybe sometimes- As a researcher, than, yes, yes, sample, right? right? <laughs> and as a, as a supply company, it is also, right? So as, private equity has come in, there's been more investments. It's been one of the major, you know, supply, supply acquisition and how people buy participants and recruit participants for study has evolved so much because of how much money has been invested in the technology and the efficiencies that can be gained within those kinds of systems, right? So they drive a lot of margin, they drive a lot of profit, and they drive a lot of valuation for these companies. Um, they don't necessarily have the same motivations as researchers do, right? To get to the best quality example along the way, more just how much supply can we fit into this funnel and make it as usable as possible. Well, you're raising a really interesting issue, which is, you know, forever that those of us who do survey research, you know, to some extent, the onus has always been on us as the researchers to check our data and make sure that the respondents are legit, right? Um, right. You know, I look at, you know, are they, you know, are they completing a, what should really be an eight minute instrument in 30 seconds? Okay, so right. identify those speeders, right? Identify right. the people whose answer options are clearly illogical, you know, and sometimes, you know, we'll even set traps, you know, in a way, or red herrings, uh, right. plant some red herrings and stuff. And yeah, so, so we've always had some responsibility ourselves as the researchers to check these things and um, to use some of these simple ways of cleaning the data before we actually doing our, we do our analysis. But you know, as I'm hearing you talk about how different the panel, the sample is being um, sourced ultimately, um, I'm wondering if those types of steps are going to be enough. Um, is that, is it gonna become increasing, is there something about what's going on that might make it harder for me to catch 
authenticity issues myself? I, I think so. Um, <clears throat> and, it, you know, the problem isn't getting worse. And, I, and you're right in that researchers have taken that onus and that responsibility over the years. And I think um, there's, you know, we talk internally sometimes about the concept of acceptable loss, right? Like there's almost like this acceptance that you're going to kick out a certain amount of people, right? But that that also equates to labor on the researcher side and you're using your most valuable asset to clean data, right? It doesn't seem logical to me and the problem is getting worse, right? So the more you can do on the front end to clear up your back end issues, that will save you time, will save you labor and put those kind of hours to use on stuff that's gonna drive value for your company rather than suck it up, which is what's happening now. Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that excerpt from our interview with uh, with Andrew Moffat. I just think Andrew's fantastic. So if you have any questions or feedback for him, uh, certainly you should connect with him on LinkedIn. Um, otherwise, if you have any questions or comments, please do um, leave them here in uh, the comments here, um, or feel free certainly to contact me through the Research Rockstar website. And if you're finding our conversations for Research Rockstars to be helpful, please do subscribe and review. Uh, the more followers we get, the more we can do with the series. Thanks, everyone.